Okay, I have to talk right now and explain why I made this. So, a while after or around the time Volume 5 finished, I wrote a post to Tumblr about a hilarious idea I had. It became the most noted thing I posted there with some people liking the idea and adding on to it. Sadly, no one actually came through and created it. This here is my best attempt to make it real. Let's find out with Raven what the Relic of Knowledge is. Nothing beats a cup of herbal tea in the morning. <laughs> Fools! I have three versions of this. On with the video. In this final video for Volume 5, I will be covering other aspects of Volume 5's story, episodes 11 through 14, and then finally finish with my overall opinion of the volume. There's a specific aspect of Volume 5's writing I want to talk about, which is the dialogue. More specifically, the dialogue in the exposition scenes around Ozpin. This is another topic that is hard for me to understand, so I had to think about how the dialogues and other stories were able to pull me into their worlds, scenes, and characters. I got two ways in which this happened. First up is the combination of interaction and character dynamics. Both deal with how the characters speak and interact with one another. I got this in two shows, Spice and Wolf and Black Lagoon. The interactions between Lawrence and Holo always got my interest and are always entertaining. I loved hearing them talk and mess with each other. Black Lagoon brought me in through its character relationships, the main part of it being the power hierarchy between the characters and how this is emphasized in their dialogue. Bella Laika speaks to her subordinates in Dutch with respect, while she will speak in a belittling manner to just about everyone else. Rock is one of my favorite characters because of this. He is docile most of the time, but the writing gives him moments to try and assert power. Roberta's blood trail is where this side of him gets to come out. Ruby has always been pretty good when it comes to character interactions by giving them moments of hilarity and drama. Volume 4 introduced Salem and her dynamics with her subordinates. She even speaks with a very threatening tone to Lionheart which is very different to how she speaks with everyone else. There are good interactions in Volume 5, but the point of me bringing up the dialogue are the exposition scenes. These scenes do have decent interactions, although I think the interactions outside of a few are a little weak. Definitely not bad and do maintain my interest in the scenes, but the point of an exposition scene is information, which is what my second point is all about. The second way I found dialogue to be able to engage me is by character but for my purposes, point of view. By point of view, I mean the character's history, background, and motives, and how those are brought into the dialogue of any given scene. This came from Tales of Exilia, which is my favorite video game of 2013. In Tales of Exilia, you either follow Mila or Jude, along with a party of six total characters. Each member brings with them a specific point of view to any piece of dialogue or skit. The only characters that are weak in this regard are Leia and Elise. Leia is Jude's highly energetic childhood friend who isn't as educated as Jude, but is just as skilled as him. Elise is an orphan who was a looked down upon youth until Jude intervened. So then, why is the point of view of our characters important when it comes to the exposition in Volume 5? That's because they barely get utilized. The first exposition scene between Ozpin and the students only utilizes two points of view, the students and Ozpin. That's two viewpoints out of six characters. Another viewpoint isn't added until Yane and Weiss take part for Episode 7's exposition scene. The point of the first exposition scene's dialogue is to get the basics of Ozpin, his powers, and parts of his history known. But the problem is that the students only respond or ask questions in a basic manner. Here are some questions the writers should be considering when writing these exposition scenes. What about this information is important to the characters? What can the characters add or build upon? What questions or topics important to them could they bring up? Let's look back at an exposition scene in Volume 4 and how much better it uses each of the characters' points of view. In this case, there are four being utilized in the dialogue and the structure of the scene symbolizes them. You have Crow sitting by himself facing all the students, Ren and Nora sitting together directly across from Crow, taking him at face value and asking general questions. Jean and Ruby are on opposing sides looking at Crow in different angles. Jean is looking at what Crow is saying based on how it relates to Pyrrha and is expressing his agitation at what had happened and what he has learned. Ruby is looking at this from the angle of her familiar relationship to Crow and how she feels somewhat betrayed over the lack of trust Crow gave to her. 
Five characters and four points of view are being used to make this exposition seem interesting. In Volume 5, why wasn't John and Ruby giving unique viewpoints when talking to Ozpin with everyone? It would kinda suck and be repetitive to give John an angle on Pyrrha again, but it would be useful to see how Ozpin reacts and let the audience know what he has to say in regards to Pyrrha. Ruby is being targeted by Salem for her silver eyes. Why not have her inquire as to what they are and why Salem would be after her? This is what I find a dialogue to lack in these moments. The interaction and dynamics between characters is a little weaker compared to what we got before. We still get some great moments between the characters. For example, the moments between Blake and Ilya and Weiss and Yane. The thing that hurts the dialogue the most is the poor utilization of the characters' unique perspectives. This ends up making the dialogue boring and not as important for the characters. So now I finally get to the antagonists of the volume. We got the traitor Lionheart, Raven and Vernal, Hazel, Cinder, and Adam. Lionheart was a character who I thought was doing what was best for his kingdom by not fighting the villains. I felt as though they were using him and keeping him in the dark about their true intentions. Then at the end of the season we learned that he does in fact know about the White Fane attack and that the villains are going to attempt to destroy Mistral. Now I know he is acting entirely in his self-interest. Especially after his dialogue with Oscar hoping to use him as a way to free himself from Salem. In the end, he got what he deserved in the best way possible. If I leave now, I, I can avoid the authorities and come find you. I'll do whatever it takes. I'm gonna kill you. What? <laughs> Coward. Thank you, Amon V. Hell and Dr. Tran. Moving on, Vernal is a character who doesn't actually have much character. She is loyal to Raven, so much so that Raven can create a portal to her. She's skilled in combat and acted as Raven's scapegoat willingly. Other than that, I can't tell you much about her personality. We just are not given enough time to get to know her. Same thing goes for the rest of the bandits. Raven, on the other hand, is a character I hate. I don't even mean that in a bad way. This is the same kind of hate I have for Ichigo in Darley and the Franks. I hate Ichigo because of how selfish and uncaring she is towards Hero and Zero Two. She did it all because of her own desires, twisting things and those around her to get what she wants. I hate her because of that. Same logic goes for Raven. Raven is completely hypocritical, justifying her actions in such twisted ways as a means to show that she is strong when she is, in fact, not. Never really given a reason why she left, only for it to be revealed that she killed the last Spring Maiden and ended up getting the Maiden's powers. There's no way she could justify that to anyone by saying it was an act of mercy. There's one thing I find interesting about Raven. She does indeed care about her daughter. She went to check on Yane at the end of Volume 3. That's her! I really want to know more about Raven and Ty. I want to learn why she originally abandoned her loser bandit tribe to marry Ty and have a kid with him. Hazel is a character that immediately grabbed my attention with his statement in Episode 2. I immediately got interested in what his deal is and why he is a part of Salem's group. It is disappointing to learn that the reason why is because his sister died during a training mission and he blames Ospin for it. Then he goes to try and kill Oscar slash Ospin and decides to kill the rest of the students making him hypocritical. Oscar gives the obvious response to Hazel's issue on the fact that it was his sister's choice to go and become a huntress, which Hazel isn't able to give an adequate response to. What Hazel could have responded with is the fact that his sister wouldn't have needed to make that choice at such a young age if Ozpin didn't make that choice available. There is definitely more to Hazel than what we have been shown. I'm willing to bet that Salem has promised to bring back his sister from the dead if he helps fulfill her goals. The only thing I have to say about Cinder are that it is interesting to learn that her arm is now grim and that she is not dead. She is not dead. I repeat, she is not dead. This is a trope I call falling into a pit of unknown. When this happens to a character, anything can happen, which means the character can survive the fall because we don't see the body. It is a 50-50 chance the character lives or dies, if you want to see how ridiculous this can get. Check out this clip from X-Play Splinter Cell Co-op Theater. <laughs> huh? Ah! Hello. You felt like 40 stories! And would you believe that at the bottom of those 40 stories was a crate full of marshmallows? No. And you'd be right. So how did you live? Love. Love? Love. Whose love? Your love. My love? Mm-hmm. What the hell are you talking about? Also, we didn't get any payoff on the conflict between Ruby and Cinder, so it would really suck to kill Cinder off now. I also feel as though Cinder is to Salem as Ruby will be to Ozpin. 
The last villain antagonist to talk about is Adam. Oh boy, this is a doozy. Adam to begin with all the way back in the black trailer is very skilled and powerful. When we finally see him in the show proper, he beats Blake down, impales her with his sword, and then goes to one-shot Yang, slicing her arm off with a single swing of his sword. Adam in Volume 4 haunts Yang and is a constant worry in the back of Blake's head. All this builds Adam up as powerful, skilled, and intimidating. He is a force in two of the main cast's narratives. Volume 5 takes that and practically ruins all of it. Adam is made to look like a whiny pushover in the final episodes of Volume 5. Where are his skill, strength, and terrifying presence? This ultimately caused me to lose interest in Adam for Ruby's story going forward. The things that were built up about him are gone. Blake doesn't even care about him anymore. Why should I care anymore when the main cast doesn't as well? The fact that Adam is there during the final episodes didn't even affect Yang, who, in the previous volume, had nightmares and shell shock anxiety about him. I would be pretty okay with how Adam is defeated and still relevant to the story if they kept Adam up as a competent fighter with an intimidating presence. Blake and Sun take care of him way too easily, and in the most unsatisfying way. I do like Blake and then Sun's statements to Adam on how Blake isn't here for him and that people aren't willing to fight for him. To end this section of the video off, Ruby has the most disappointing story and Adam is the most disappointing character. I will be floored if the Kruby were to make Adam interesting to me again going forward. The Adam short didn't help and only feels like a response to the necessary addition to the show. Now I get to talk about episodes 11 through 14. I'm going to get into why these episodes don't work, how they are a poor final battle and conclusion for Volume 5 in the Mistral arc. Reason number one, stakes. This is a yes and no reason. The no comes from how dire the situation feels with episodes 11 and 12. Not completely, but it's there. The problem actually stems from what the heroes are fighting to protect, Mistral. The problem begins all the way back at the beginning of the volume with how the setting is introduced. The setting of Mistral is introduced only with 2D environments and characters. The environments look like they were taken straight out of a concept art folder. The people are 2D images being barely animated. This comes off as extremely lazy and doing so disassociates the setting from the main cast of characters and the world they occupy. This instantly makes the setting and the people living there feel unimportant. Ranger also never goes anywhere, besides Haven Academy which the only person there is Lionheart. Why should I care about this kingdom and its people? I really think this volume should have included the rest of Team Sun in some way. Have them meet up and show Ranger and Oscar around and at the same time offer another perspective at what Mistral is like and currently going through. Maybe even have them help Blake and the Faunus of Menagerie take care of the White Fane. Doing this will help flesh out Mistral as a setting outside of the world of Remnant in the first episode of Volume 5, establishing a connection with the setting, the characters, and the audience. Depending on how far you want to take it, it feels as though Mistral is a world from Kingdom Hearts where only the important characters populate the world, which makes it feel empty. Reason number two, character actions. You can already guess what I'm going to bring up in regards to this. Jean, Weiss, Emerald, and Mercury. These characters have moments where they do or are doing something that just doesn't make sense for their characters or the given situation. Jean attacks Cinder when she is wide open in the most pathetic, amateurish way possible. The way he has been built up from every volume prior suggests that he would never launch an attack like this. He had the perfect chance and distance to attack Cinder, but he is made more incompetent than he actually is in order for him to whiff so badly he falls over and drops his weapon completely on his own. Then we have Weiss and her constantly trying to summon, even though Vernal has made it clear that she will not let that happen and can easily take it out. Weiss, even in this volume, has never been dependent on only one aspect of her semblance to handle any given situation. In this volume, Weiss uses her summoning when she has exhausted pretty much all of her available options or when she doesn't have anything else to go to. It never felt as though she was depending on it to get by. I don't know what she was expecting when she completely left her back open to an opponent who can just straight up shoot her. This is another moment where a character loses because they are made more incompetent than they actually are. Weiss only went on the offensive against Vernal one time. There's a way to do this well, and Yang vs. Neo is an excellent example. Finally, there are Emerald and Mercury and how they tried to stop Yang. First up are the actions they take to do so. Emerald goes for a jump or tackle and Mercury just grabs Yang's prosthetic arm. There are other actions they could have taken that would have worked while still allowing for Yang to get away. 
Emerald could have tried to show her an illusion again, but Yang quickly realizes that it isn't real and runs through it. Mercury then goes to do the same grab as before, but tries to follow it up with a kick. Yang releases her arm, allowing for her to dodge and continue to get away. The other part of why their actions are a problem is what they are there to do. Do you remember why the villains are there? They are there to kill the heroes and capture Ruby. Why are Emerald and Mercury going for restraint against Yang? It would make more sense for them to try to harm her than restrain her. This ends up hurting the stakes of these episodes, because with these actions, Hazel is the only one trying to kill or severely harm our group of heroes. Reason number three, the action. The issue here is comprised of two problems, how hard the action is to follow and how poor the individual fights intersect. There are two reasons why the action is hard to follow. First off is the number of inconsistencies and animation issues. Just for episodes 11 and 12, I found 28 issues in which the characters teleport, disappear, or are doing something completely different to what we last saw them doing. I even found an animation error in which Jean's left hand isn't being animated to continue holding on to his sword. The second reason is how a good chunk of the conflicts end up going nowhere or just straight up stopping. Crow and Raven start fighting in episode 11, the next time we see them in episode 12, they are no longer fighting. Ruby joins Jane to fight Emerald and Mercury, but the only part of their fight shown is Ruby headbutting Mercury, and then later, Ruby and Yane are no longer fighting, with Mercury and Emerald nowhere in sight. Their fight only continues in the background of this scene. And of course, the battle that has been raging for the last four episodes ends off screen. I better mention the fights that do progress, which are Weiss vs. Vanal, Cinder vs. Jean, Ruby vs. Emerald, Raven vs. Cinder, and Oscar slash Ozpin vs. Lionheart, and then Hazel. Part of the reason I find individual fights crossovers so poor is because of my expectations going in. Since there were going to be so many characters, I ended up expecting the action to go down in a similar fashion as Dead Fantasy 1 and 2. I was hoping the action for these episodes would have the characters shown fighting next to each other and alongside each other. That rarely happened. We get a 2v2, but it only focuses on the 1v1, never showcasing either team fighting together. I'm clearly disappointed. The other reason for this is due to how controlled the fighting feels. It's like all the characters have been paired to play together, and then are sectioned off and told that they can't play with anyone else until they are done playing with their current partners. Seriously, one character does not join the fight with another set of characters unless they are not currently fighting anyone else. Things actually start well at first by the three main fights for episode 11 in which Ruby is distracted by Cinder, and Cinder purposely stops your fight with Jean to attack Weiss. If I haven't made my problem here clear, essentially, all these characters are fighting in the same room, but none of them intersect while the intersecting fights are still ongoing. Here's what could have happened when Vernal broke Weiss's aura. Ren and Nora are fighting Hazel right next to Vernal and Weiss. Ren could have broken away from Hazel to go back up Weiss. Now, Ren and Nora are defending Weiss and fighting against Vernal and Hazel. This still leaves Weiss open to Cinder's attack. Fourth and final reason, the climax. This is going to come off as pretty weird. The climax for these episodes, which takes place in episode 14, is Yang confronting Raven. Again, I enjoy it and think it would make for a good climax to these series of episodes, but it has one major flaw. Yang's struggles and conflicts are not the major focus for episodes 11 through 13. Yang fights Mercury to start with, but the only part shown of their battle after his initiative is Ryu's animation. After that, Yang is turned into Mercury's punching bag when Emerald joins him, Ruby joins in, but we don't see Yang fighting with Ruby or even against Emerald, except for, you know, in the background. Then later, Ruby tells Yang to jump down to where Raven, Vernal, and Cinder is alone even though they have no idea what is going on down there. The main focus for these episodes is Oscar and Ospin's conflict with Hazel, but we don't see how the characters finally overcome Hazel. So we get a nice emotional climax that doesn't completely work as one, and the actual main conflict of the previous episodes wraps up off screen. If the focus was more on Yane in these episodes, I think people wouldn't be so disappointed with the finale. To finish this section off, I want to explain what these last four episodes do well. There are specific animation sequences that I really like. Vernal blasting through Weiss's ice barricade taking out her summon is fantastic. The attack is fast, and playing the attack twice makes it shocking. 
Oscar fighting Lionheart and then Ozpin fighting Hazel are both quick and the animation makes all their strikes and movement feel hard and urgent, which I found lacking in other fights. And of course, there's this sequence from the Raven vs. Cinder fight. I really like how the story follows through on this dude by explaining why he wanted to join up. It does so by showing that he knows someone in the White Fang. Lastly, I really like the conflict between Hazel, Oscar, and Ozpin. Time to put on my analysis hat. Hazel and Ozpin are both wrong in this conflict, while Oscar is in the right. Oscar stands his ground in front of Hazel. This makes Hazel hesitate for a moment, but ignores Oscar's statements. Ozpin then forcefully takes over and never says anything to Hazel, opting to only fight and beat Hazel down. This won't convince Hazel of anything because Hazel can't feel pain. So, Ospin's arguments to Hazel won't reach him. I'm really disappointed that we didn't get a solid conclusion to this conflict, while still leaving more of the conflict for later. Imagine if Oscar pulled together all of his willpower to regain control over his body in front of Hazel, causing Hazel to hesitate again. And this gives all the other characters their chance to beat him. There's one thing I would add and change to the final episode. This deals with Ruby. I would have it so Crow tells Ruby to go after Lionheart, so that he doesn't get away. But Lionheart is dead at this time. Ruby enters Lionheart's office and now finds herself indirectly face to face with Salem. Salem says some intimidating stuff and maybe even references Ruby's mom. The rest of the cast are shown Emerald's version of Salem and Ruby ends up indirectly meeting Salem. When all is said and done, Salem is gone and we see Ruby holding in her fear as much as she can but her silver eyes become somewhat active to the point where they make it look like as though Ruby is crying. This is a little shaky, but the point is to have it so Ruby meets Salem, while everyone else is shown a representation of Salem. How terrifying would that be for Ruby? It's finally time for me to express what I overall think about Ruby Volume 5, but before I do so, I want to reiterate on Volume 4 because my opinion has changed over the past year due to two reasons. Volume 4 is placed in the plot and a realization while I was making one of my videos after it. If you look at a typical plot diagram, and bear with me on this, you will see the graph be split into sections. Introduction, Rise in Action, Climax, Fall in Action, and Conclusion. You can view each volume so far as a part of this graph. You're probably seeing some issues with this already. Volume 1 is our introduction, Volume 2 is the Rise in Action, Volume 3 is the Story Arc's Climax, Volume 4 is the resulting falling in action. Volume 5 is the conclusion. With that, I think Volume 4 works well as the falling in action to this arc due to how it shows the effects of the climax on all of the story's characters. Even I can tell that saying this is a little ridiculous, but looking at it in this way helped make Volume 4 more appealing to me. The other thing that happened this past year is that I finally finished and put out my fan trailer for Volume 4. What this ended up doing is make me look at Volume 4 in a different way than how I was looking at it before for my series of thoughts videos. Essentially, making the fan trailer made me realize the most important part of the volume that I somehow neglected. The emotion. Volume 4 does a great job showcasing the emotions and drama of each character and story in that volume. So I now have to update my original score of 2.7 to a 3.7 out of 5. Only a few storylines don't fully dig into the characters, Rubies and Yanes. It ultimately makes Volume 4 a little disappointing, especially when I consider how the action scenes were handled. Even so, I have to admit that I did get a good amount of enjoyment from the volume. So where am I at with Volume 5 then? I find Volume 5 to be a true mixed bag of quality. There is a lot done well, but there are also a lot of issues. The technical team has made major strides throughout the years, but the story and animation are where things become a little messy. Yade's story is the best handled and the one I got the most from. I also really like how Weiss and Oscar's stories went in this volume. I never mentioned this, but Crow going around looking for huntsmen and huntresses is amazing. On the flip side, Blake's story is half decent, Jean's is missing in the middle, and Ruby's doesn't go through much of anything. I did really like the scene where Ruby sees Yade. The quality of the second half compared to the first is not good. The only main issues I have with the first half are on how the setting of Mistral is presented and how Sienna's death didn't matter. The second half is where the story issues become the most noticeable in show don't tell, story progression, and overall execution. The character animation is great, while the action animation needs some work. 
The action animation has started to move in the right direction, but the animation needs to be made a bit faster and be made more impactful to give it a better sense of urgency and purpose. The editing also needs some work here or there. There are some shots that are cut to way too early. Those shots being Weiss gasping, the bandit girl attacking Yane, and the shot of the White Fae member standing and then running into the light. It's as if they cut to the moment where the director yells action at the start of the shot. The action scenes construction and execution need major work. The amount of inconsistencies in their presentation is getting ridiculous. They also need to move away from having characters standing in place when fighting each other, and have more interplay between fights. I did, in fact, enjoy Volume 5, but I didn't enjoy it as much as I did the others. I really liked getting introduced to the characters in World in Volume 1. I highly enjoyed the action and character moments of Volume 2. Volume 3's execution is amazing. Volume 4 did well at its most important aspect. So then, my score for Volume 5 is going to have to be a 3.3 out of 5. Volume 5 is sadly lacking in overall execution. This ended up as a pretty weak volume thanks to how the final half of this volume was handled and how underexplored Mistral is as a setting. I only have one question to end this video on. What did you think of Volume 5? Scream.